whatnot uh, for the freight market. No, we talk about uh, the economy and the freight market and combine it together. I'm Zach Strickland, head of freight market intelligence. With me, as always, chief economist Anthony Smith. Uh, and today we're going to, obviously, we got a big story this week. Uh, for those of you that have obviously been watching the news for transportation, the second largest uh, merger purchase whatever you want to call it, if you will, of a trucking company to cover today, for sure. Yeah, that was huge. And uh, this show is appropriately titled because, of course, I have stuff from the Fed side and the economy side of March Madness. So yes. much going on. And the Fed continues to fight inflation. Yes. And we're going to talk about that, how that is influencing the backdrop of this uh, seemingly hotbed of M&A activity right. uh, for supply chain and just about anything right now uh, as valuations continue to come down in light of those federal rate increases. That's right. And of course, you'll see me looking down from time to time. That is going to be because I'm going to be watching LinkedIn feeds as the show goes on. So, of course, there's a lot of news and updates to kind of jump into throughout this episode. So if you have a take on some of the activity happening in the freight markets, if you have an opinion on what's going on in the macroeconomy, what's going on with the Fed rates, what's going on with inflations, jump in on the conversations and become a part of the show. Yeah. So, Anthony, what say you? Uh, we got a lot to cover today. Let's yeah. let's set the tone with a market in two. Let's get you into it. Count me in. I'll four, make sure that the back's ready. Three, there, so, yeah. two, and one. All right. As usual, starting things off with our outbound tender volume index, a measure of total truckload demand in the United States, counting the total tenders going from shipper to carrier. Uh, some percentage of these are being rejected, but a very small percentage. Right now, just about three and a half percent of these tenders are being rejected by carriers, meaning that they're basically auto accepting everything. And it makes it a very clean measure of total demand in the market. Uh, March, talked about this last week, a little bit of a bump here. I've, I've removed two of the primary pandemic years with all the volatility. So the green line you're looking at is last year. The purple line you're looking at is 2019. Just to put it into context that this is what we would expect from a more seasonal pattern. Uh, you know, the last two years we didn't have that seasonality. It looks like we've got a little bit of that showing up in March still. We had a little downturn. Now a little bit of an uptick at the end of the quarter. We typically see March being a little bit more of an active month because of the fact that it is kind of that first month outside of uh, winter. So moving forward uh, into the IOTI, uh, another measure of demand here, but on the maritime side, IOTI counts the bookings uh, that shippers are ordering containers coming from all across the world into the United States. Uh, this index is now right around that 2019 level there in purple. Again, I removed the pandemic noise, uh, except for that early part of last year when bookings were still occurring at a pretty high level. Uh, nowhere near that at this point in time, but it looks like demand is following a somewhat seasonal pattern. This is somewhat positive news for those of you that are moving freight. Let's move to the next chart here. NTIL. Uh, so the spot rates, excluding fuel, uh, this is doing, again, kind of a bottoming activity, bottoming out. Not any strong upward pressure, however. Uh, we're significantly lower than last year and only a few percentage points above a year ago, but it is still trending down a little bit. Amazing, as always, Zach. So one of the big things you mentioned here, of course, early signs of somewhat seasonal trends potentially happening. Yeah, I, and and that's, you know, Craig and I debated this a little bit. He's got a little bit more bullish, but that's based on his expectation. You know, mm -hmm. he was kind of head faked in January because we had this demand cycle kind of, we came out of the holidays. Normally you expect this, this cliff where there's just no freight whatsoever. Right. That really didn't happen. And so it made him a little more optimistic. I was like, nah, I ain't buying it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, this one to me, I'm actually, you know, Regardless, I mean, I, I have to kind of put a footnote there because the economic situation with the consumer makes me nervous. Right, right. You and that, that, that kind of brings some hesitancy for me as well, especially with, I think, not, you know, I, the, the widespread industry outlook for, at the beginning of the year was that, hey, it's going to be a slower first half, but things are going to really start picking up in the second half. But really, I think as we get further and further into the year, that's getting pushed out further and further as well. Yeah, the consumer's still active. Yeah. I mean, these rate increases that we're seeing, they take a long time to manifest into the consumer, and the debt levels are what are really scary to me. 
Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's definitely scary. And especially when you see savings rates still not really picking up that much. There's no incentive. Yet. There's no incentive at all. Um, and then, of course, you hear the, noise, the, the stories about, of course, jobs, 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 jobs. But really, we're looking at the jobs that are available right now. A lot of them are going to be around service sector, restaurants, yeah. hospitality, things like that. And not as much as, like, of course, you see, you know, top stories. Of course, we're on some LinkedIn's right now. And so you're seeing latest layoffs happening. And those aren't the same jobs that we're seeing open right now. Yeah. And of course, the bank failures, we, we talked about that a little bit last week when we had uh, Dr. Rogers on. But again, yet another kind of, <laughs> I, I don't know if this is an indication of a slowdown all the way, but U.S. Express getting purchased by Knight Swift. We'll go to the news stories. This is obviously the lead story of the week. Um, and FreightWaves, of course, shares a ton of DNA with U.S. Express. Most of us, including myself, a lot of us have worked there or spent some time there. Uh, a lot of what I know I can actually attribute to my experience with U.S. Express. Uh, and a lot of the people here can say the same thing. Uh, U.S. Express arguably responsible for modern day freight brokerage. Right. I don't know if, you know, many people really know that, but Access America back in the mid 2000s got its start out of a lot of former U.S. Express people. Now, there was some investment that came in from outside of there, people that headed that up, but they took a lot of the people from Express Direct, which was really, it's really the blueprint of modern day brokerage. Right. You have pod structures, it's kind of been moved around a little bit, but this is kind of like that boiler room mentality. Uh, all, a lot of that got its start at U.S. Express. Yeah, and I think that's important to kind of lay out mm -hmm. because it laid out the groundwork for a lot of what we're seeing today. Mm -hmm. And so this is, of course, a huge movement here. And as you said, the second largest uh, merger uh, transaction for a truckload. And sounds like it may not be over just yet for Knight Swift that they might still be on the prowl. Yeah, yeah. And of course, Knight Swift, of course, the single largest truckload uh, carrier, for hire carrier in, in the United States, uh, making this purchase uh, and really bailing U.S. Express out, mm -hmm. uh, for lack of a better. I, I know uh, for those of you that watched the uh, coverage of this the other day on Freightways Now, uh, some, of the, some of the sentiment was like that. We were a little harsh, but... Yeah. I, you know, it is what it is. Like, I, I, I certainly can't sit here and criticize, you know, Eric Fuller for taking a risk and it just not panning out. Like, right. I, I, I would, I can't say that I would be better. Right, right. You know, I, I don't criticize people for doing things that I myself have not done, not willing to do. Uh, it just didn't work out for whatever reason. Uh, I'm sure that the, there's some managerial stuff. I mean, and it, it's, it was a pretty big miss, and yeah. you got to call it what it is. The uh, fourth quarter OR in 2021, and I want to pull up a chart here to put this into data context. Uh, NTI, I want to pull up the NTI, not the uh, that one, uh, but NTI, there we go. So if you look at the peak, this is the measure of spot rates in the United States over the last several years. The peak of this is in fourth quarter of mm -hmm. 2021. <laughs> And U.S. Express had an OR of 101 uh, point something in that, in that, which is, this right here is an indication of how tight capacity is. Right. So essentially, uh, Knight Swift, their purchase, uh, the company that purchased them, had a 77 OR. I, I just, it's just, I, I mean... I hate to say it, but it's it's a it's it's not just a swing and a miss, but yeah. it was a, it was pretty much the debt. Like this is the downfall of right. this, you know, this company. And lessons should be learned from it. You yeah. know, I hope that at some point we get more clarity around how you know Variant, uh, which was their you know this big initiative, a technological initiative, gets a lot of the blame, the onus of responsibility for this. Uh, but two things had to have happened here. Right. Um, for this to really manifest. Their operation had to be just and just complete turmoil uh, because you could show up with a truck in the fourth quarter of 2021 and make money immediately. So that means their operational efficiency was just not as good as it should have been. But right. also, that also means their pricing <laughs> was completely misaligned with their operation. So there, there's a push and pull here, and I don't know how much one or the other had to do with each one. Um, you know, U.S. Express had a large amount of debt, but that's not factored into the OR. Um, and so I, I'm going to be curious as time moves on if we can get some clarification over how something like this 
could have happened. Uh, you know, U.S. Express is effectively getting a second life, in yeah. my opinion. This is actually one of the best outcomes for a company like that had such a big miss um, in the fourth quarter like that. And, you know, now that we're entering, I mean, you, you saw the chart. NTI has fallen almost like it's not all the way back to where it was. Thank you, Fuel. Uh, but yeah, it's it's fallen dramatically. And this is another reason why U.S. Express is having trouble or was having trouble is that the market itself, once they missed and they figured out, oh, we need to deprioritize this initiative uh, and fix some things, the market turned on them almost immediately yeah. <laughs> and said, no, you're not going to get any leeway. I mean, now spot rates are arguably moving at a discount to cost, meaning carriers are hauling a bunch of freight on the spot market just to keep their trucks moving at a loss. Right. And Zach, I think that's a great point that you made earlier is that if you people were falling into money uh, mm -hmm. during that time frame, and if you weren't able to be profitable at that time, that shows that there were definitely a lot of things wrong there. And so we're looking at this deal, I think Craig Fuller said it, you know, uh, is somewhat of a bittersweet day, yeah. of course. But I mean, when you're looking at uh, what's going on with this transaction, it's almost a pseudo win-win, as you said, US yeah. Express essentially getting bailed out, but Night Swift getting an incredible deal here, especially yeah. with the equipment Night Swift that is gets coming along. Two and a half billion dollars of revenue right yeah. away. And uh, if from outside looking in, and uh, this looks like one of the smartest purchases that you can make because you're buying a company that has some pretty obvious low-hanging fruit. Right. Uh, and they were already on the path to fixing some of it. They just didn't have the runway or the time or the environment to operate in because their debt and their uh, just the fact the market, they, they weren't going to have enough room to make money. You can't yeah. make money in this type of environment for long. I mean, it takes, Craig and I had this conversation. It takes a special type of person to be in trucking. Yeah. <laughs> this is a very salt of the earth industry. You have got to operate, you've got to scrap for every penny that you make. And 2020 and 2021 were the anomalies, obviously, where it wasn't as hard <laughs> as, as, it, as it normally is. A 101OR, of course, meaning you're losing a cent for every load that you move right. on the cost side. And I, it's, you know, to me, this is like, it. I love the risk taking, <laughs> but at the same time, this was obviously one that was just it wildly, it just went wildly off the tracks and it didn't work out. Yeah. And, you know, you gotta, I, I hope that there's some lessons that come out of this. And I, I, I've seen it before. Uh, and of course, some of the anecdotal evidence there uh, about some of the managerial decisions, there were people in the room and I, this happens at every company. This isn't a U.S. Express thing. There's people in the room that know that things are happening, going down a bad path. And they're overridden by, you know, some managerial decision. This, this is common. This happens every single day. Um, and apparently a lot of the new management there that they had brought on for Variant and for that initiative was basically overriding a lot of the incumbent. And that's why they led to a lot of churn. I don't have specific examples of that, but this is not like a huge leap of logic to think that something like this could happen, considering that it happens literally every day. Yeah, and especially, I mean, when you think about that churn that starts to happen, mm -hmm. that's when you start losing, I think, buy-in from some people. Mm -hmm. If someone's new and they haven't been there for a long time, I mean, it doesn't mean that they're not committed to it, yeah. but it also means that, hey, maybe I'm not, uh, I'm gonna take this as accountable because, you know, I'm just here for a little bit of time. I'm just gonna make a pit mm -hmm. stop here make a few changes and then keep it moving. And so when that churn starts to happen at those high levels, at that you know kind of rate, that can definitely be a downfall for many companies, not just this yeah. one. And like you said, I, I really do, um, you know, I'm looking forward to, I think this could be a great case study yeah. in the years to come to see, okay, what were the kind of, you know, shifts here? What were some of the pivotal moments that happened to really cause some of this, you know, um, you know, decision-making and really the outcomes that we saw here? Yeah, I'll also hear, you know, Max Fuller, uh, of course, founder, CEO of, for a long time, until uh, Eric took the reins, really deserves, you know, tons of credit here for building this company. I know him personally, uh, and the legacy, I think, is stronger than the name of U.S. Express itself. Right. You know, just because of all the things that we talked about, Modern Day Brokerage arguably got its start. The amount of talent that came out of U.S. Express, I mean, like I said, Freeway does not exist without U.S. Express. Right. Um, and... A lot of other trucking companies ha have 
picked up people from US Express and has been a big deal. So a huge training ground for a lot of freight fr transportation. And I think that's actually stronger <laughs> in yeah. terms of legacy and, and you know, kind of persisting through time than just the trucking company itself. Oh, 100%. And, and again, Knight Swift, of course, is not going to just rip this company apart and and they're gonna, they've done a great job with Swift of maintaining some of that structure, and they'll do the same with US Express. I think it's a really good uh, move in the long run. And one of the things I think I, I remember Craig mentioning, um, I think many years ago in a conversation, is really one of the big things around you know mergers, acquisitions mm -hmm. is um, the culture and really mm -hmm. kind of like maintaining certain cultures and really how to integrate certain things. So I think um, this could be an amazing outcome potentially with, you know, if they can adapt some of the positive attributes, of course, from Knight Swift, get things back mm -hmm. on track. And I think the future is for sure bright here. Potentially. Yeah, Knight Swift, of course, well, obviously knows how to operate a trucking company. I think they'll be able to easily correct whatever, you know, and I, I don't think that they really have that much work to do yeah. to make this a profitable entity. And I think, uh, you know, there's enough people at U.S. Express probably there right now that know exactly what went wrong and how to how to correct it moving forward. So it's right. it's it, you know in trucking you just don't get a lot of room to make mistakes. Right. Um, right. And unfortunately, that's the way it crumbled there. But I think long run, this is this this is a pretty decent outcome. Uh, for that. So as you mentioned, uh, Knight Swift M&A still on the prowl for LTL companies. If you look at Todd Maiden's recent article here, Knight Swift to remain on the M&A prowl, still looking at LTL targets. This is fascinating to me because Knight Swift is the largest truckload carrier and now even more so uh, in the United States uh, after this closes in four months, of course. But uh, LTL is a different beast. Is I personally went from trucking or truckload to LTL. It's like going from basic math to calculus. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that they have purchased AAA Cooper and Midwest Motor Express in the last couple of years, um, and they're doing extremely well. Yeah. And time will tell because LTL, uh, you know, is it operates at a multiple of truckload in terms of cost, but also revenue. Uh, so you get it costs you more money to operate, but you get more money generally in the long run, it's, it's a little bit more profitable because of the risk that it incurs, uh, but it is way more complicated uh, yeah. to deal with here. They've purchased, like I said, AAA Cooper, who is in the Southeast and, uh, Southeast and the Midwest Motor Carriers, who is in the upper Midwest. Uh, potential targets here look like, uh, you know, Northwest, Southwest, and, uh, you know, the sectors they just don't cover with their LTL network. So I think that uh, we'll see that happen probably this year yeah. uh, because the M&A environment is, is actually, now's the time, I've been asked this question numerous times, is uh, because the valuations or the multiples are going down, is that bad? I'm like, absolutely not. <laughs> when valuations go down, that's when you buy. Yeah, That's the secret of the financial industry. <laughs> like they have to make transactions when valuations are up. Right. But the smart ones make purchases when they're down. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Buy low, sell high. It's, exactly. <laughs> it's about as basic as it gets. Exactly. And I mean, conversely, on the other end of the spectrum, we also have another story um, from Clarissa Hawes uh, about a company that wasn't able to get saved here. And that is going to be around a Florida-based flagship transport company that has ceased operations pretty abruptly here. Yeah, uh, flagship transport, uh, roughly 455 truck drivers. Um, this story here is interesting to me in the way that it just kind of stopped. <laughs> um, this is this is probably what I would not expect to happen generally. It looks like they ran out of money, started floundering and flailing a little bit. It's still unknown as to what's going on. Uh, the drivers that they're talking to in this article um, basically said that their checks bounced. I hate to see this, yeah. there, and there and there's drivers that are stranded. Like, if anything, don't don't do this. Just call it. Right. <laughs> like when you when you get to this point in time and you have people that are depending on you. I know that this. I don't know the entirety of their situation, but they messed up. Yeah, you messed up. Don't continue to lean into a bad decision yeah. um, when you know that the game is up and you've lost. Don't let other people get sucked down into your collateral damage. Right. And that's what looked like happened here. Unfortunately, this is not uncommon inside of the trucking industry. Um, it's, gonna, it's a tough environment. Sometimes things go south on you faster than you expect. 
Uh, it looks like they were trying to get financing, but then just didn't come through for whatever reason. And now communications basically shut off. And uh, Zach, speaking of collateral damage, yeah, uh, we got some recent activity here not too long ago from our boy Jay Powell and, and the Fed. Um, let's, let's break this down a little bit. So <laughs> we've had the banking situation. Yeah. And that's almost like, like we, and here us in transportation supply chain, we kind of know what, we're kind of on the front lines of inflation and what's been driving it. We were kind of like, hey, I remember in 2020, you said, hey, this is going to inflate mm -hmm. <laughs> the costs. This is not the way that we were uh, printing money. It, inflation is going to happen. Right. Then we were told that it's transitory inflation. Right. 2021. Then, oh, no, we have to raise rates as fast as we've ever raised them because inflation's out of control. Right. Now we have a situation where banks starting to show some shakiness and lack of confidence or the people have less confidence in them. Investment sentiment way down compared to where it was. Right. Tell me how this storytelling from the, from the Fed makes sense to you and why they're doing it. <laughs> so this is exactly what that is. It's a story mm -hmm. um, being told, whether it's a good story, a bad story, whether it's a, based on a true story, it's a fake story, completely fiction. It's a story nonetheless. And as you mentioned, we were told that, hey, there's not going to be any inflation. And then next thing you know, we have inflation. Then we're told it's going to be transitory. Next thing you know, it's not transitory. Then we're being told that, uh, hey, we're on sturdy ground. And I think it's because the environment that we operate in, the life that we know in the U.S. is all based around trust. It's a trust system. And once that trust, that confidence is eroded, you get things like bank runs. You get, um, you know, small regional banks that are now put in these difficult positions of like, hey, no, 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 your money's going to be safe here. No need to pull it. But now the sentiment's kind of starting to erode and the potential for, hey, you know what, I'm going to maybe pull into a larger financial institution that I feel a little bit more confident about. So there's this narrative that needs to be set in place. And so when we think about um, the tools that the Fed has, of course, there's, um, you know, being able to raise rates, raise rates, and then Drop there's rates drop rates, quantitative <laughs> easing and quantitative tightening. Yeah. Once we saw, they don't, I haven't heard it being said by the Fed or FDIC that there was um, a bailout. They're, they're not saying that because that, I don't think that fits into the narrative mm -hmm. or the story that's being put out right now. And the other big thing is that we haven't been told that this is in, in term uh, in sense a quantitative easing because I, I think it is in a, in a sense quantitative easing here. They're giving money <laughs> exactly. to the people. Yeah. That's that's exactly what it is. It's quantitative easing. Right. So in that sense, is is a pivot. But before this event happened, we had the testimony from Jerome Powell, and he was seemingly very hawkish in his outlook towards the economy and people expecting a, a 50 basis point increase after that testimony. Then we have the, 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 the SVB and the other bank really start to kind of start showing that shakiness in a very big way. And the tone softened ever so slightly in this uh, last meeting that we had just yesterday. Now we showing that, hey, you know what? Um, I, we're still confident in the banking system because he has to say that. That has to fit but into the But he doesn't have line. to raise the interest rates. So I think he raises the interest rates to show his confidence. You know how you said yeah, earlier, when Actions. the game is over, you have to call it? Yeah. And so I think um, he doesn't want to call it just yet because the inflation is still very much a thing. And I think he is looking to continue to further his interest rate increases as he can have that tool to lower it in the future because they've already started quantitative easing. So that's one tool I think that's already kind of out. And so the big bad <laughs> but, thing- But isn't this, isn't this contradictory by nature? Yes. And Quantitative easing and increasing your rates contradictory. Th this, this, this makes it, to me, this is actually worse mm -hmm. <laughs> because I'm getting conflicting messages. Uh, and I don't know, like it's- doesn't make any sense. Doesn't make any sense, but mm -hmm. it's just a storyline nonetheless. And so th this story is going to continue, I think, as we get to the latter parts of the year, because next thing you know, what we don't want to see is say, hey, you know what? He completely doesn't just pivot, but makes a U-turn. And now if we start to see quantitative easing and then lowering of interest rates at the same time, is it going to be timed well enough that inflationary pressures continue to subside and that we don't see decline in the U.S. dollar, and then that's going to be inflationary building. And then we start to see any kind of sudden shifts and shocks in the employment market that we haven't started to see just materialize just yet in terms of initial jobs claims and the unemployment rate. So 
these are all the, the you know the different elements the storyline that's being pushed forward yeah and you know i don't i'm not one for stories when it comes to uh, financial decision making yeah. uh, it either is or it isn't uh don't tell me uh that, that it's you know I, I, I'll refrain from using any vulgar language here, but uh, I think it's, uh, it's a rainy day. Something about yeah, raining <laughs> and, and something on your back. But the uh, yeah, I think at the end of the day, he's trying to build some level of confidence. I would rather you do what you think is right. Right. Yeah. And I mean, it all comes down to the story, and we'll see how the story develops in the next week of Freight Analysis.